It's time for another episode of Corner of the Galaxy from the Box. The show that gets you behind the scenes of the LA Galaxy and into the minds of soccer reporters and MLS experts. Your hosts for the day are Corner of the Galaxy's Josh Guessman and LA Times soccer reporter Kevin Baxter. Let's start the show. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Corner of the Galaxy from the Box on cornerofthegalaxy.com. Josh Gethman, Mr. LA Times himself, Kevin Baxter, on the show, back with us again on a special Tuesday night edition of this show. Uh, remember, we said we couldn't do it on Monday. Kevin was traveling with hockey and all that fun stuff. Well, that is uh, that is done with for now. Kevin's in the house, and we are able to talk about the game and all of the wonderful information that Kevin and I have been able to gather throughout the last week and so we're excited to bring all that to you but let's check in with mr kevin uh baxter here first kevin how you doing you you finally settled in one spot there no i'm not really i'm not sure what country i am in i think i'm in the u.s right now but actually the playoffs will if the ducks advance they'll stay in the u.s so no more passports needed for these playoffs <laughs> that, that's a, that's a good thing for you all right so game seven for the ducks coming up so you'll be watching that one to see if you'll be traveling anywhere uh, with, my, with my fingers crossed, and I won't tell you which way they're crossed. <laughs> I was going to say, I have a feeling I can I can infer that. But before we get any further, I wanted to get to a very special introduction that we have. So I'm going to play that for you, and we'll talk about it right after this. Welcome to Corner of the Galaxy from cornerofthegalaxy.com from the box. I'm your host, Madison Cole, here with Josh Gessman and Kevin Baxter. Take it away, Josh. All right. Thanks, Madison. There's Madison Cole. Madison put out one of, I think, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe it's a little scary for me, Kevin. In fact, I know it's scary for me. Uh, put out an excellent uh, video on Facebook that I shared. Uh, so if you're friends with me on Facebook, you can uh, you can go see that. Uh, but Madison did her own little episode of uh, Corner of the Galaxy from the Box, mostly because there's so much to talk about, Kevin, that everybody's getting in on it. She did a wonderful job, had her call in and give us a little intro so that way she can be our honorary co-host for this particular uh, uh, show. But Kevin, if I was you, I would be very worried about your job security. Well, I am. I mean, this is the academy system, right? Isn't that what the Galaxy is doing now, taking the veterans and replacing them with academy people? And believe it or not, I'm even older than Steven Gerrard, so I think <laughs> I am in danger, definitely. Yeah, you're, 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 you're definitely in that soccer life cycle. It's starting to trend down, starting to trend down. But Madison, thank you for that. Uh, excellent job. Keep up the great work. And anytime you're uh, near here at the studio, you're welcome to come in and give us your thoughts on the LA Galaxy. All right, let's get to the LA Galaxy now. Uh, we're going to talk briefly about the game. If you saw or listened to our Monday night show, with uh, Britt, and Britt and I had uh, had had looked over some of the post-game audio. We have a lot of that. You sort of got a feel for the game through that, but we want to get Kevin's thoughts on this as well. So, Kevin, the LA Galaxy come from behind 2-0 to nothing to draw 2-2 two -two to the Chicago Fire. Uh, initial thoughts on the game? Uh, the second half was a great half, and, and, you know, you can't help but look at that and say the two guys who were supposed to be their, their leaders, the two guys who actually shared the the captain's armband in the first half, Jermaine Jones and, and Yella Van Damme were both off the field when the Galaxy made this spirited comeback. Um, you know, it was, again, some of the best soccer that they've played this year, probably. However, you know, one thing is both goals came on set pieces, so they still don't have a goal from a forward uh, in open play in the run of play this year. Uh, uh, Gio's goal there came off a set piece. And everyone's all excited, you know, after the game. I think it was Kurt Onofo who said this This is the spark we needed. This turned our season around, and a lot of the players said the same thing. But it was really 45 minutes, and they go on the road for the next four games. They play the Red Bulls after a cross-country trip. They come home. Then they fly to Minnesota. That's a long trip. Then mm -hmm. they come home and play the Earthquakes, who are playing really well at home this year. And then they go back across the country to play D.C. United. Um, those are four tough games. Uh, the opponents in, in most of those games are pretty tough, but the travel is really going to be a grind on some of these guys, especially the newer guys like Joe Pedro and Roman Alessandrini. So uh, it, the Galaxy on a real high right now, but they're going to be tested to find out whether this is whether they really have turned a corner or whether they just played a good half. Yeah, I mean that's sort of the big question now, and and you know I think we're going to even hear from some of our callers later. Is you know do we even trust them with this? I, you know they've said it after their their win over ten men teams. You know this is what we needed. We feel good now. This is what we're going to do going forward. All that stuff. You know do you do you believe them after this, or has something really changed? I mean the the big crux of all the reporters talking to all the players after the game was what changed. Tell us how it changed, and nobody could give you. The physical part of it, I think a lot of it had to do with Yellow Van Damme not being on the field. I think a lot of it had to do with uh, with Jermaine Jones uh, getting injured and being off the field. 
None of them, probably nobody wanted to say that, but I, I think it was more than just those guys being gone. There was a mental sort of switch that clicked here for the LA Galaxy. I don't want to be overly optimistic, as Kevin, because people always harass me for being the optimistic one. Like, I'm the one who's always trying to urge the Galaxy to be better than they are. I look at this four-game road trip, I look at what's coming up, and I sit there and go, in all likelihood, if you had even odds, you know, 50-50 chance um, of zero points or four points coming for the LA Galaxy out of four road games, um, I'm going closer to zero points than I am the four points right now. That's a scary thought if you're an LA Galaxy fan, knowing this is the slowest start for the LA Galaxy uh, since 2007, I think, 2006, 2003, actually. 2006 and 2003, they're tied for, uh, for or, or have, have a little bit less points. So here, I'm actually going to open up my, my book and get the exact numbers because I did a whole bunch of charts and graphs today, Kevin. It was a lot of fun. Uh, well, I'm a, I'm a, while you're looking yeah, that up, I'm going to say I'm a little more optimistic. I think they could beat Minnesota United and they could pick up a, a point somewhere else. I, I say they get four points out of those four games, but kind of to your point, they just had a three-game homestand uh, against a, a win, you know, including a game against a, a winless Philadelphia team and a Chicago team that struggled on the road. Um, so they had a three game homestand. They got two points out of a uh, possible nine. And people are looking at this as having turned a corner. I mean, the bar is pretty low. And I think it is pretty low because the early season has, has been so poor. But again, when you're talking to those players about what changed, I talked to a veteran player today, uh, and I'm not going to give his name. It was off the record and it was just a, a, a friendly chat, but the decision to replace Yella Van Dam in the first half, to take your captain out of the game uh, with a 2 nothing a deficit, um, this player told me that Kurt Anafo got the team back. That was the word he used, that, uh, you know, the team, uh, it, it, the individual players celebrated that move and felt like Kurt Anafo had finally taken control of the team, did something that he had been a little reticent to do, bench, uh, you know, a really good player and his captain. And so when he made the move to do that, um, a lot of the veteran players, probably some of the younger players too, felt like Kurt had taken ownership of the team, which he had been reluctant to do. And another thing this player said is that throughout his MLS career, he's seen a lot played on a lot of teams, and he's seen teams where, when you bring in big money players uh, or you know players that are ab- above above the the, the maximum salary al- uh, allocation, which in this case people like Jermaine Jones, Pedro is a TAM player, Von Dam. He said when you bring in players like that, they almost always get three or four or five opportunities to to mess up before they're taken out where a, a cheaper player may not get those extra opportunities. And he said, but when a coach gets to the position where his job is in de- in jeopardy, you know, management will tell them, use the big money players. And when then when the, uh, the manager's job's in jeopardy or the team really needs a win for whatever reason, then it's like, do whatever you have to do to win this game. And this veteran player felt like the Galaxy also turned that corner in this game too, where it was like, Let's not worry about how much money the guy makes. Let's worry about what he can do on the field. And so you may see some unusual lineups going forward. You know, Kurt Anoff was today at training that his decision whether or not to play Yellow Van Damme in the next game or any future games is right now a day-to-day situation. Yeah, which is which is crazy to think if you go off of last year. But this is, you know, I, I'm going to follow up with with a conversation that I had, um, you know, to somebody who would, who would also know these things, um, is that... Yes, I mean, sort of the feeling that I got in the locker room after Saturday's games was there was relief from the players. There was this uh, this sort of weight lifted off their shoulders. They felt like they were energized. They didn't want the game to end, and they thought that you know you you could sort of tell that they thought that Kurt had had gained some points, had had won some stuff back. And I will say that you know talking to this player that that's how they felt. Um, they felt like this was a gigantic step forward, and those are my words, but sort of using what they have told me, I, I think I'm, I'm catching the, uh, the, the drift here. So this is not something small, and I know everybody wants to sit out there, and I, I, I see it right now. You look at what Yella Von Dom has done since he joined the LA Galaxy, Kevin, and he has been one of the best, most solid players the LA Galaxy had, especially last year. Uh, he was a surprise. Most people didn't even know who Yella Von Dom was. He comes in, he dominates the league, he does wonderful things for the LA Galaxy throughout the entire season. This is what, you know, these are the surprises that you want. This was, uh, you know, a good find by Jovan Karofsky to bring him in and to do these things. So you you, you see that and you get excited. But I'll tell you, the, the Yella Von Dom that we have seen 
seen in 2017 has not been that same guy. And if people are still flummoxed as to why Cardinalfo pulled Yellow Von Dom out of this game, I can point you to both goals. And you sit there and go, Josh, Yellow Von Dom fouled, you know, a Chicago player in the box. Um, you know, that just happens. It was desperate defending. And I will say it had nothing to do with the foul in the box is why Yellow Von Dom got pulled. He has been, and ever since he joined the LA Galaxy, a guy who likes to send balls over the top, Kevin. He's a guy who likes to skip the midfield, try to hit that those guys up the wing or the guy in the center and that type of thing. And sometimes that works when there's lots of space. But this year, with Kurt, Kurt doesn't seem to like to play those types of balls. And in both cases, in both goals, Yellow Von Dom and a long ball led back to a Chicago goal. Directly with the second one and if you follow the ball and trace it all the way back, you can find where Yellow Von Dom gave a long ball towards Alessandrini that was easily intercepted by Chicago on Chicago's right-hand side. They transition that ball to the left-hand side. The penalty kick ends up coming from that left-hand side right there. That's why. Pay attention to that stuff. It's not just Yellow Von Dom of last year. It's this year and what Kurt Onolfo would like Yellow Von Dom to do. It's very, very interesting whenever you start going back, even into the very first games. Against Dallas, Kevin, you could point to Yellow Von Dom and some of the mistakes he made in that game, either staying too far forward or being out of position, that caused goals to go in. And it's been a theme in this LA Galaxy team, and I think everybody knows it on the team. And this was a correction, a course correction from Kurt Onolfo. Maybe, maybe one of the first things uh, that you can really point to to say this had an effect on the team. Well, yeah, I mean, you make a lot, a lot of good points there, and you see that in a lot of different sports. You have a, perhaps you have a baseball team that likes to, to run a lot and hit and run and, and put the ball in play, and then all of a sudden they sign a bunch of sluggers. Well, what do you do with that guy that has 30 or 40 stolen bases? All of a sudden he doesn't fit in anymore. He's still a great player. He still has a lot of weapons, but he doesn't work in your team anymore, and perhaps Yella has gotten caught in that sort of a situation. The Galaxy is changing the style of play, and either he can adapt – or hasn't understood that there's an adaption that needs to be made. Some of the interesting stuff that was said after the game were Kurt Anolfo praised Dave Romney. I, you know, I, I read a lot into that, especially in, in light of what you just talked about, where he's kind of anointing Dave Romney as maybe maybe this is the guy we go forward with for a little while. Um, you also look at some of the other things that Kurt said, like, I am the leader of this team. Really? The coach has to say, has to publicly say that he's the leader of the team. Shouldn't that be assumed? And he also said that um, he intimated, I don't have the exact quote in front of me, but he intimated that that Yellow was not ready to play from the first minute, yep. um, that he was not ready to go. And if your captain is not ready to go at the opening whistle, that too is a really bad sign. And, and finally, the third thing that will be really interesting to watch and, and interpret this as you will, I don't mean ill will toward anybody, but... It's been pretty obvious to me that Yella and Jermaine Jones have not been on the same page and have, at times, I think, maybe feuded with one another on the field and, and and even in training. Well, now Jermaine is not going to be able to play for at least a month. I, I actually think it's going to be much longer, but at least a month. If if Yella plays, and there's no guarantee that he will, but if Yella starts and plays, it'll be interesting to see how he plays. You know, Was the chemistry between he and Jermaine Jones the problem? Or, it, again, is it more of a, a style of play thing that Yella has just not adapted to? Yeah, I mean, and that's what it is. And a lot of people will point out, and we talk about Jermaine Jones and the injury, uh, an MCL sprain uh, to his right knee. Uh, that was the same one that he had the LCL problem with uh, in, in Colorado, Kevin, and, and I think was out for something like 14-plus weeks. Um, this was part of the reason why he only played uh, in nine games total, I think, in the regular season for Colorado. Also a six-game suspension that was tacked on to the beginning of the season. Also the fact that I don't think he signed right away with Colorado, so there were some games in there. So there's lots of reasons why he hasn't, he wasn't on the field with Colorado, but a large, large majority of that was uh, this injury. So a lot of people point to his injury and him coming out as the catalyst for the LA Galaxy's success, the getting Jermaine Jones out of the midfield and allowing Baggio Husidic and Joao Pedro to really, I mean, the Galaxy went to a 4-4-1-1. It was nothing amazing and special. You know, Giovanni Dos Santos dropped back into the midfield, was able to be more of an offensive player from there, and they let Baggio and, uh, and, and uh, Joao Pedro sort of do their thing there. And I thought, again, Pedro had another step in the, in the right direction. I thought Baggio Husidic played well um, in terms of uh, of his job, his marking, his defensive ability. And, you know, I think that Chicago, 
Uh, for whatever reason, whenever they brought off uh, David Akam, just sort of fell completely flat after that. And if you looked at it, a lot of the offense came through Akam. So, you know, you look at all these things, but again, I think people want to separate the Von Dom and Jermaine Jones things and try to figure out which one had a better, bigger effect on the LA Galaxy. And in my mind, you can't separate them. You take them both at face value, and then you get to see what's going forward. And if Yella Von Dom starts, which I imagine he does... That's just right now. I know I know. Kurt said it was day-to-day. I think that Yella Von Dom is going to start the next game as long as I think that his mind is in it during training and that he's ready to go against New York on Sunday. Uh, I think he starts again, but we're going to see what kind of effect Kurt had on with, with, with benching Yella Von Dom and with Jermaine Jones and that injury and what the Galaxy are able to do with that. Well, you know, one name we haven't mentioned is the French Flash, Roman Alessandrini, right? He had the, uh, a great game delivering crosses into the box and, and, and played a part in both goals, right? Yep. Um, and he was not at training today. And, and the official response uh, from the Galaxy Insider, Adam Serrano, that was posted on the team's official website uh, was that uh, Kurt Anoffo said that uh, Alessandrini just needed a little bit of extra time tra- uh, training upstairs, which, you know, general, a lot of times means some sort of medical rehab with the physios or doing some other kind of work where he's not allowed to do soccer related activities. Uh, this, this is Tuesday. They leave on a Friday. Um, that gives him at best two, maybe what, two and a half days. If they do a half day of training on Friday before they leave, um, certainly he's fit, but everybody else was on the field. I, I don't think I buy completely 100% into that, uh, into that excuse. And if Allison Drini does not show up for training tomorrow, I think a lot of bells and whistles need to go off because that is not a good, that is not a good sign. Yeah. I was going to say everybody needs to sort of keep an eye on that. That is sort of uh, one of those wild card things we knew about Jermaine Jones and, you know, uh, we saw Jermaine Jones limping around in the locker room after the game. So it was something that we saw him sort of limping. Was It was kind of expected that perhaps he would be out for a long time. That's sort of what comes out. That's what happens. Um, like you said, Galaxy are putting a three to four week time frame on that. Um, it can be anywhere from three weeks to three months is sort of uh, where I come down on it. So uh, we'll see how all of that goes. But yeah, I mean, this road trip is gigantic. We already talked about it. Uh, Kevin, you said how much traveling is involved and, and there's a ton of traveling involved going back and forth. You know, it isn't a road trip in terms of like the Galaxy are going to go to New York and then stay in New York before they go to Minnesota. Um, you know, they'll come home and then fly to Minnesota again. And, you know, sometimes you look at that and, and all the traveling that has to be done and the time time zones you're traveling through. And for LA Galaxy team that, that needs to get points on this road trip, they really need to get points because they have, and, and I actually got my notes out this time so I can, I can say it, they have eight points through nine games, all right? And through nine games for all the other seasons, you have to go back to 2006 and 2003 where they had seven points through nine games as the uh, as the low mark. Now, of course, I excluded some of those wacky shootout years because those were those were ra- wacky. Because in 1999 they had six points through nine games, and in 1997 they had four points through nine games. But in a lot of cases, they actually had uh, a whole bunch of different things that happened in shootouts, and they lost in shootouts, and so it's always hard. So we'll go, we'll go to the modern era starting in 2000. Um, the LA Galaxy have never had this many or, or this few points. Uh, since 2003 and 2006, which is saying just a ton. Also, if you go to uh, if you go to my my Twitter account, if you go to Corner of the Galaxy, and I'm going to try to post an article with it here very soon, I put a chart together that shows in the last 10 years the LA Galaxy starts. Um, this goes you know points by game and and how it climbs. And right now the LA Galaxy being off to their slowest start in the last 10 years and trending towards that 2008 line, probably much more than than even that 2009 line, which is a, a year they actually finished pretty well. So if you if you look at that chart and sort of break that down, you can understand the the situation the LA Galaxy are in. It's it's almost historic in the fact that they've started this slow and now they're going to have four road games. And MLS teams don't win on the road. The LA Galaxy don't win on the East Coast. I think the last time they won on the East Coast was like 2012, Kevin. Is, does that ring a bell? Like against Philadelphia, I think, is the last time they yeah, won on the East Coast. Yeah, sounds familiar. Yeah, yeah. So, so 2012, um, this is this just, it's not, regardless of their mindset, which I would say is very positive right now, and I would expect if they had another home game that they could go out and beat a lot of teams. Um I don't know if that happens on the road, and and again, it's it's a really big question for me. But I mean, you know, the the big sort of question is what kind of control does Cardinalfo have? If we think he got it all back, Kevin, um, has he saved his job for a little while? 
I think he has. I think he's given himself a little bit of a buffer. Um, I, you know, I will say for people looking for uh, some positive notes, uh, Seattle had, I believe it was 20 points out of 20 games last year when they went on their run and wound up winning the MLS Cup. So, uh, you know, there is hope for the Galaxy. They, they play the majority of their games in the second half at home. Uh, that'll help them. I think Seattle went uh, largely went on its run with a lot of home victories. So the Galaxy has that going for them. Um, yeah, I, I do think Kurt Anoffo did because the thing that the thing that worried me about Anoffo um, after the Philadelphia game wasn't so much, and, and the Seattle game too, wasn't so much that the team lost in the Seattle game. They looked really poor, but he didn't appear to have the respect of the players. When you saw Boateng and Ashley Cole refuse to shake his hand and other players openly feuding on the pitch, the second half of this game with the players saying, hey, he, he finally, you know, um, uh, made the decision to get Van Damme out of there. Uh, Jermaine Jones is gone. We're going to play. We're just going to go out there and play and throw caution to the wind and do our thing. And they seem to come together for the first time this year. You still hear players talking about, um, you know, we need a little more chemistry. We need to to get on the same page. People should not be saying this, uh, you know, after nine games and after preseason, but they still are. So they're moving in the right direction. I, it wasn't so much the team's performance that I thought it had an awful in trouble as it was the perception that he had lost the team. Now he has clearly gained the team back. These next these next road games are going to be really tough. Uh, and I think Kurt needed this boost of confidence and, and boost in job security uh, going into this stuff. And I, I will say one last note on Jermaine Jones. Um, he's 35, and it, that knee is already severely damaged, and it's the same knee that he injured again. Um, you know, Kevin Durant, or Devin Durant, as some people call him <laughs> online, uh, had the same injury, and he's 28, and he missed six weeks, and he plays in a non-contact sport. So... Um, I don't think we're going to see Jermaine back. I'd be surprised if he came back in three to four weeks. And moreover, uh, even if he was ready to go, if I'm the Galaxy, I don't take him on any of those road trips. I don't sit him in the middle seat on a Southwest flight uh, with a bad knee flying across the country. I just uh, did that. That doesn't make any sense. That would be the worst thing for him. So, you know, even if he were healthy, maybe June 17th, the home game with Houston, and then I probably leave him home, leave him home, and don't send him to Colorado, and then have him play against Sporting Kansas City again at home. So, uh, best case scenario for me would be Jermaine Jones playing two games between now and July uh, July first. Um, and you know, by the time he's ready to come back, who knows if Bajo Husidic and and Jao Pedro are playing really well, uh, according to what the veteran player I spoke to today said. You know, when you need to win, you go with the guys who win. You don't go with the guys that make the big bucks. Maybe maybe Jermaine Jones becomes a part-time player. Yeah, I mean, then, you know, alarm bells go off all over the place as, he was, as he's going to make a ton of money this year for the LA Galaxy, Kevin. And, uh, you know, even with the TAM money that he's taking up and everything else that's sort of in between, that is a questionable signing whenever they made it, knowing he only played nine games. And so if that is the case... Um, you know, I think they could have allocated their dollars better. Um, you know, it's a freak injury. It certainly isn't a, um, this isn't because he was old. All right. This, it, it, you just, you, you can't put that into perspective the way that he got hit and the way he fell and all those things that happened. It was a freak injury. All right. It could have happened to somebody, let's say like Sebastian Legette or Giassi Zardis or Robbie Rogers or any of the other myriad of young guys who have also gotten hurt. And in Sebastian Legette's case, you know, freak sort of injury uh, that keeps him out for a long time. So that doesn't seem to be the case. But at the same time, you saw what he did last year and. He has. I don't think that he has been enough on this team uh, to warrant them sweating this injury very much, Kevin. And I'm almost with you. Is that you know maybe he doesn't see uh, the field for a long time. It is. It is 39 days as we're recording tonight. 39 days until the LA Galaxy return to Stub Up Center to play against the Houston Dynamo. That is. What? That's a ton of time. When you talk about uh, allocating resources, I'm. I'm just saying here. I'm just. I'm just giving you the facts okay you guys do with it what you want i'm just telling you that according to the players union guaranteed compensation for jermaine jones this year is going to be seven hundred and twenty two thousand five hundred dollars and twenty cents i don't know how they came up with that his base pay is six hundred thousand right. guaranteed compensation is seven twenty two five hundred and twenty cents janino who plays basically the same position or almost the same position Seven hundred and sixteen thousand six hundred and seventy-four dollars and sixty-seven cents. So, basically, Janino is almost six thousand dollars cheaper. I'm yeah. just saying. I'm just saying. <laughs> yes, but could you, you see? Here's the whole thing: is this is this is the argument 
towards everybody saying, well, of course, the LA Galaxy should have got Juninho back, but he came in an allocation, and Chicago was first in allocation, and Chicago wanted him, and Chicago no, got him. No, no, you're wrong. No? They we're not first in allocation. They were third. They they actually traded up to oh, get they, uh, to that position. They traded now, up. Yeah, they traded up, so, so Chicago was able to get him, but Houston and at least one other team also wanted uh, Juninho, so... According to Juninho's agent, uh, a Brazilian um, person I spoke to uh, last week, um, according to his, his agent, um, there's no way the Galaxy would have got him. They would have had to jump to, through too many hoops. But um, Chicago traded up to get him, so it, it's not impossible. And Gal- I know Juninho wanted to come here. I, I'm just throwing it out. I'm just having a little bit of fun with it. I'm not saying that they really had a chance to get him. But when you talk about uh, allocating resources, um, uh, you know, Janino would have been a, a good addition to this midfield. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, and and if you're keeping track, uh, Jermaine Jones, I believe, got a raise over his last year guaranteed compensation of something like seventy two thousand five hundred dollars. So not only did he only play nine games for the for the Colorado Rapids last year in the regular season, but he got a raise for playing nine games last season with the Colorado Rapids and got up to uh, I think uh, the seven twenty two number that that Kevin quoted there. All right, last thing that I want to talk about this in this game, uh, Yellow Von Dom is the captain. He gets pulled by Cardinalfo. He gives the armband to Jermaine Jones. Jermaine Jones gets injured. He gives the armband to Giovanni Dos Santos. Giovanni Dos Santos scores a goal. Uh, are we getting Gio back? Is, is Gio back on track now? Because he certainly looked like he was more involved in this game. He was more dangerous. He got the goal. I mean, this, this seems like it's trending in the right direction for Giovanni Dos Santos. Yeah, probably. I mean, it my understanding is uh, he was dangerous in the second half, and I'm wondering if that has to as much to do with the slight change in formation uh, as anything else. And the fact that, um, you know, Jermaine wasn't breathing down his neck and he, he had a little bit more room and freedom. Uh, you know, he and Alessandrini were able to operate a little bit more. I thought that it was interesting putting Jesse's artist in the midfield as well. Uh, I'm going to attribute it more to the absence of Jermaine Jones and, and the, the formation change as opposed to Gio off finally capturing lightning in a bottle. We always knew he could do this. It's, uh, I think the question always has been, does he want to do it? And that might be a little bit unfair, questioning, questioning the guy's uh, devotion and, and motivation. Uh, it, it does, I, I agree, it does look sometimes like he takes long periods of the game off. Um, but is he uncomfortable? Is there something go- else going on that we don't know about? Um, you know, Kurt does not throw guys under the bus, although, you know, he did throw Jer- 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 Yella under the bus this weekend, uh, which was interesting. But, um, you know, we always knew Gio could do it. He proved again he could do it. Now it just becomes a matter of will he do it? You know, whether it's a motivation thing, whether it's a formation thing, whether it's tactical, uh, whatever it is. I-, I think it was a good step forward for Giovanni Dos Santos. He's still got a score from the run of play. And I think he needs to get some assists, too. He needs to to prove that sort of playmaking ability that he had last year. Remember, he led the team in goals and assists last season. Right. He was a playmaker and a goal scorer. He needs to be both on this team. If you know, if Gio gets going and he teams with Alessandrini and then Giassi's artist finally shows up, that's as good a three as, uh, you know, offensive threesome going forward as any team in the league. We just haven't seen them all three. In fact, we haven't seen more than one at a time this year right. um, until the second half. Saturday. Yeah, no, that that is absolutely the case. All right, let's get to some uh, some player co- or some some uh, listener calls. Uh, I, I don't remember if I played this one last week. Uh, so if it sounds familiar, Kevin, it's probably because I played it last week. But this one was from after the Philadelphia game. But I wanted to let Devin from Corona get in on this. And like I said, if we have uh, if we have played it, we'll just answer it again. I don't have any problems with it. So here we go. Hey, it's just Devin from Corona, also sitting in section one forty two. It was good to see the riot squad with a sign that said "fix it." So we want to see something get get improved with the with our galaxy. Um, I got to say, I haven't seen Chris Klein or Peter um, in in you know in the stadium. So why are they hiding from us? Second thing is, I don't like the Galaxy Two philosophy of teaching the guys the Galaxy way. Uh, so far, it's not getting us anything. In fact, the team took 11th place in USL last year, and nobody's contributing this year. So shouldn't they be playing to win at all levels? Um, that's pretty much what we want to do. And then lastly, is there anything we can look forward to for the rest of the year, be optimistic about? I mean, uh, this team was pressing this last game. Uh, they created opportunities. They were pressing. They couldn't get anything. Else. It just seems like they're too stressed trying to score. And the other thing is, I don't think they can beat any other teams in the MLS right now. If you look at the standings, look at the other teams around the league, is there anybody they can actually beat? So looking forward to hearing the show, and good luck. Bye. 
All right, there is uh, there's Devin. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate it. Um, like I said, I don't remember if we did it. Uh, listen, I'll tell you right now. I see Pete Vianis and Chris Klein all the time. Um, I, I'm sure probably they. I, I'm sure Chris, Chris and Pete would probably like to see me less because I always say hi. Always want to stop and talk for a little bit. So uh, I've seen them both multiple times. Kevin, I know you run into those guys as well. I think that. Perhaps they don't go traipsing through the stadium as much uh, anymore. But I, again, I see them out on the concourses all the time. Yeah, I see them around too. And uh, I often see Pete with a cell phone pressed up to his ear. And I'm, I always want to know, is there any really anybody on the other line or is that just a way to avoid questions? Right. Um, but yeah, I do see them. Um, they, they will come over and shake hands wherever you see them. Um, I kind of get the impression that they don't want to stop and have a long conversation. But they appear friendly. Um but yeah, I, you know, I, I think to the to the caller's point, they have to be a little bit worried. This thing has gone south, and you know, as we talked about, I think last week or the week before, I had the feeling that they went into this season uh, totally convinced and confident that this experiment, the the Galaxy Two experiment, was going to work, and it's gotten off to a slow start. So, I, I I think they are a little bit concerned, and you know, they've gone this far. I know that they're they're out there trying. We hear about Carlos Vela and and all kinds of other players that they're trying to bring in. Uh, and as long as the team struggles and as long as the manager seems to be, uh, you know, in a little trouble and not in control of the team, players of that caliber are not going to want to come here. And the interesting thing is I had a conversation with someone earlier today, someone from U.S. Soccer, and we were talking about the Galaxy has always been the destination because it's the Galaxy and it's L.A. And in the past, the fact Bruce Arena was there helped them a lot. Well, they're still the Galaxy in a sense – they're still in L.A. It's still a desirable location. But you know what? Next year, LAFC. So if you're a great player and you want to come to L.A. and you're a little bit uh, concerned about the direction the Galaxy are going in, but you want to be in L.A., now you have a second option. Chivas USA was never really that option. Yeah. So uh, that's got to be another thing that's kind of I, – I, I can't believe that LAFC is not – uh, you know, lurking in the back of these guys' minds in the front office when they're out there trying to sign players and trying to develop a philosophy, uh, philosophy going forward. Yeah, I would. Uh, again, we've heard them say that they don't worry about them, Kevin. That they say that they're the LA Galaxy. They don't have to worry about LAFC. And if I'm them and I say that publicly, I have to think that privately that they know exactly what's going on and that they're keeping track of of what LAFC is going on. I, I you know, I want to talk to to the other point that um, you know, shouldn't we be trying to win? at all levels and you know LA Galaxy 2 worrying about that and and LA Galaxy listen um yeah I mean there's something to that I guess if you really want to do it but LA Galaxy 2 has produced some guys um that are playing right now that are playing you know actually you know pretty good you got Diallo who's been playing good Daniel Steris was one of those guys that even though he spent a little bit of time there uh that came through that uh I would say that if you're concerned about you know all the strikers or or, or the goal scorers that LA Galaxy 2 uh, had that were supposed to be coming up, like Jack McBean, Ari Lasseter, Jose Villarreal. Um, I will ask you how many strikers on the LA Galaxy senior team have been scoring goals as well. So um, I don't think that we've had a very good, fair judgment of any of those guys yet, because quite honestly, no forward, no striker has been producing at all. You could say the same thing about Jossi Zardes or Giovanni Dos Santos or, you know, uh, you know, some of the other guys who have been played up in that in that play, even Jack McInerney, who has only played like a couple minutes of the game. You could say that about all those guys. Um, so have patience. I don't think you need to have winning down at L.A. Galaxy, too. Uh, I don't think that that's ever the issue. And I think developing players is the issue. They sent off their top goal scorer last year in the middle of the season to go play somewhere else because they realized that USL wasn't going to be enough of a challenge for them. So I think that's what you want to do is you want to continue to try to better those players. Sure win. And and with the way that that LA Galaxy 2 team is created right now, it's going to be a while before I think you're going to see any true success anymore because it's a new cycle. They're playing they're playing teams that are much older than them and they're playing, you know, very very young players coming straight out of the academy uh, up to LA Galaxy 2, which is what you want to get, is those guys professional games, professional time, professional minutes, because you have to weed out a bunch of players, and the numbers are never going to be in your favor. You're going to fail a lot more times than you ever succeed with developing players, and hopefully you can get some that you could start to sell. That's what I would say on uh, on that. And you want to add anything, Kevin, or should, or should we yeah, move Yeah, I just going to say with Jack McBean, you know, Jack McBean's always been the next big thing, and I think people are disappointed in, in perhaps the fact it hasn't seized the opportunity this year, and I would argue that Maybe the opportunity hasn't really been given to him. He's only started three games. He's only played 267 minutes, and he's a forward. And I think forwards need to have chemistry with the guys bringing the ball up. Forwards need to uh, 
um, develop, you know, get into the rhythm of a game that's hard to do when you're coming off the bench. Now, a guy like an Allen Gordon, that was his job. He came off the bench. Uh, he had the height. He played well in the air. He could change games. Um, Chad, uh, 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 Chad Barrett, or Chad, Chad Barrett, right? Yeah, Chad Barrett. That was yep. another. Yeah, another guy that could do that could come off the bench and in two or three minutes change the game. Jack McBean is a little bit too young and I think a little bit too inexperienced and doesn't have the aerial capabilities to change a game like that. So don't be too hard on Jack McBean. I think he needs a, a chance. I think he needs some consistent minutes to develop a rhythm and, and to sort of develop a chemistry with some other players. So um, you hear about this again. You know, I hate to keep going back to the sports, but you hear about this in other sports, uh, uh, you know, a hot shot college football player you know spends most of his time on special teams and he plays three downs as a wide receiver and doesn't score a touchdown and people think he's a bust you you need to get out there and be in the game before you can have an effect on it and so don't be too hard on jack mcbean i think if he gets a shot then we can judge how well he's doing but i think 267 minutes uh this deep into the season you know nine games of the season that's not enough yeah with a rather dysfunctional offense that hasn't hasn't had any striker score so i mean you could have the same argument right now about jossie's artist and i think even one of our callers is going to talk about that so uh, let's let's go on to uh, another call uh this one is one of my favorites because i think this might be the furthest anybody has ever called us from so let's hear from julio hello josh this is julio i'm calling from Osaka, Japan. It is currently Sunday, 12.29 p.m., and I see that it's already at the second half. The Galaxy are down 2-0 to zero to Chicago Fire. Um, yeah, so Kurt Anolfo has no... I mean, he obviously has lost the dressing room, and I think the Galaxy should just cut ties and try to salvage the season. Thank you. Bye. I think this is the funniest part about this is that, uh, you know, Kevin, we normally get calls after the game. And in this particular game, I got two calls at halftime, which is which is like it, it's hysterical. But first of all, just Osaka, Japan. First of all, Julio, uh, thank you for calling from there. Thank you for for even paying attention to the LA Galaxy from all the way there. But um, I'm glad yeah, we could eat you up. I'm glad we could link you to the game here. Um, but yeah, I mean, y- you look at that at two nothing. Hey. I'll tell you, as a writing perspective, and and we had talked about this in the writer's room beforehand, the story that was interesting was what would happen if Kurt Anolfo lost this game. That was the most interesting story because everybody wanted to know, would he get fired? Would he stay? You know, how were the LA Galaxy going to react? And at two to nothing at halftime and talking to the other writers, we were all like, it looks like we're gonna get that story. We're gonna have to we're gonna have to follow this and and sort of see where it goes. And then the Galaxy come back and play a very good second half, score two goals, and it's tied, and it totally changes the outcome of of things going on. I understand. I think if you are a fire curtain awful some person, which I'm I, I'm I was more fire curtain awful whenever I thought the locker room was gone. And now I'm I'm with you, Kevin, with with him perhaps grabbing a hold of it and taking command. Um, I'm going to be honest. I always want the galaxy to succeed. And if he's going to be able to do it, and this is the turning point for it, then let's see that happen. Let's see what happens. I want to see Kurt succeed. I want to see the team succeed. I want to see what that that entails with him. Now, if, you know, a note being that I can't tell the future, um, I don't know what Kurt Anolfo is going to be able to do. And this could mean that it's just prolonging the inevitable. Um, he doesn't have a great record as an MLS coach. We know that. Um, he did very well with LA Galaxy 2, despite what people want to say. Um, but now he's up at the senior team, and obviously the struggle bus all the way since the very beginning of the year. Um, if this corrects the attitude, if this corrects the downward trend that the LA Galaxy have, and they are now a coherent team linked under Kurt Anolfo, then I'm all for seeing how this thing plays out. But if you're a fire Kurt Anolfo person, you're upset right now because he has done enough, and the result was enough in Chicago, and the way it happened and the way the players reacted to it has done enough that has extended his time with the LA Galaxy for at least a little while. Yeah, he he bought himself time. He did. I don't know that he necessarily saved his job, but he bought himself time. And you know, a couple of decent performances in these four road games. You know, the front office knows that the road is a difficult place to play. They know going across country for two of those four games is tough. They know San Jose is unbeaten at home, so they're going to look at these games and say, yeah, you know, if if the Galaxy is competitive, that's probably enough. I know it's not enough for the fans, but uh, when you're judging what to do with a coach. 
that may be enough. And remember Ziggy Schmidt last year, he got, uh, well, he's in a different situation. The winningest coach in MLS history deserves a few extra chances. But, right. you know, Seattle, they were playing horribly. And Seattle waited all the way until July to make that change. So, yeah, I, definitely. I think at halftime, it, and maybe the moral of the story is don't call Corner of the Galaxy at halftime. Wait for the second half to end. But, yeah, I, it the, the mood around the team, the mood around Kurt Anafo, um, you know, uh, the, the feeling of hopefulness and all that, all that changed in the second half. Um, and, and that's why it may, maybe you can make an argument it wasn't their best half of the season. It was their most important half. Yeah, it may, it very well. For Kurt Anolfo, it certainly was their most important half. All right, let's go to uh, Brian also with a halftime report. I'll group them together here so we can have fun with that. Here's Brian. Hey, Josh, it's Brian. Uh, it's halftime right now. I just wanted to give a for, first 45-minute recap, and this is going to be a lot, which is pretty damn sad for 45 minutes. Two nothing by the twentieth minute. Yellow Van Dam subbed off for Romney for unknown Kurt reasons. I nobody will ever know, and I hope he ignored him when he went off the field. Jones is injured. Zardes is bot shot. Gio is captain. Really, they hand off the armband to Giovanni Dos Santos. Out of all people on that damn field, give it to Roe. Give it to Cole. Hell, give it to Alessandrini. Give it to somebody. Just not Gio. And then two shots on target that entire first 45 minutes. Well, it may be three by now, but when I looked at this two, less passing accuracy than Chicago. I mean, this is, this is, if this is not indicative that Kurt Anolfo, Chris Klein, and I don't even remember the damn manager's name, but get rid of him too. If it's not indicative that they need to go, I don't know what is. And I'm hoping that a lot of people are going to be leaving at halftime because I, I don't, understand how the galaxy front office is not responding to this and hopefully the fans will all right there's there's brian hey, kevin you said don't call the corner of the galaxy at halftime i say That's i right. want i want more calls at halftime because that was that was entertaining and he was fired up it just and by the way Brian's like 100% right. The attitude at halftime, because I walked around on the concourse at halftime too and went to go see some people and talk to people, and they had their head in their hands. They're like, this can't be happening to the Galaxy. It's two to nothing. They got outplayed. There's no coming back from this. The Galaxy are dead. We might as well leave at halftime. I can see all of that being true. And then you have the performance that they did. And it wasn't, you know, miraculous, Kevin. It wasn't perfect, it wasn't even, you know, you know, it, it was maybe their best 45 minutes. Maybe it was. Um, they had some they had some good 45 minutes against Montreal when they only had 10 guys. So so maybe that's uh, maybe that's the, the, the case. But no, at the same time, it's just that this was the feeling at halftime. And I think that Brian captures it perfectly. And then to see it turn around, sometimes the swing of emotions, Kevin, to me, like gives you, it's more of a, a, a mind sort of, or something you have to try to wrap your mind around than it is just the straight, you know, what did we see and what happened? The swing of this Galaxy team is dead, Cardinalfo is going to get fired, all of these things that you saw in the first half going to the Galaxy might win this game. They they drew this game. They looked decent. They looked cohesive. There was passing. There was all of these things, and they took it to a Chicago Fire team that, you know, seemed disinterested in the second 45. It's weird how you feel on Sunday after that because I felt better about the team on Saturday night than I did on Sunday morning whenever I woke up to say, yeah, but it's still a draw with Chicago. Yeah, and Baggio Husidic, you know, a guy who hadn't been in the starting lineup this year very much, he had a great game passing. I mean, he was incredible. And, you know, the the difference between the first half and the second half. And and on one hand, I don't want to uh, overemphasize this, but on the other hand, I don't see how you can't emphasize this. What was the difference between the first half and the second half? In the second half, there was no Jermaine Jones and no Yella Van Damme, and they played their freest, cr- most creative. Uh, as you said, the passing was there. Um it's hard not to come to the conclusion that that might have been the problem. Yeah. Um, whatever those guys brought or didn't bring might have been what was holding the Galaxy up because they were a totally different team in the second half. I especially like the part in the call uh, where uh, the caller couldn't uh, name Kurt Anafo. You know, he's sitting out there saying, say my name, say my name. Oh, no, no. Don't, he, fi- don't he, fire the guy if you can't say his name. He was, he was even, I think he was, the, I think he was trying to find Pete Vianis' name. Oh, okay. I think it, the, the, the general manager, I think, is what he was looking okay. for there. Yeah, but yeah, exactly. I apologize then. No, but same, Pete, s- same retort, though. You got to say his name before you can fire him. <laughs> That's right. That's how it works. He's on the phone right now, though. Pete's, Pete's busy. He's on the phone. Yeah. I just, he just walked by the office, definitely on the phone right now. Um, all right. So there's, there's Brian. So I wanted to get 
get to that one. Now let's go to back to back to California here. Um, let's go to KJ and hear what she has to say. Hey Josh, KJ from Lancaster. I was just calling because I'm listen I'm right in the middle of listening to Monday night's special player comment podcast. And I don't know. I feel like we've heard before in their other two wins, like this is what we knew the team was always capable of, and now we're going to start playing well. And then and they go on a losing streak, and then they, they drop points. And so I'm not that optimistic. Um, I'm not as optimistic as Kurt. And I think that I, I don't know if he has the clout to bench his captain and then see good results um, going forward. So that's all. Talk to you later. All right, there's KJ. Thanks for calling in. KJ, KJ's uh, daughter is Maddie, by the way, our, our wonderful, uh, our wonderful co-host that we got the intro from. So um, that's that. KJ does a great job. Uh, one of my favorite soccer people to talk to. Um, she doesn't believe it, Kevin. She doesn't believe any of these these stupid things. These stupid Galaxy players say stupidly to us media folk, uh, and she's been fooled one too many times by this Galaxy team. Um, is there reason to be optimistic about it possibly being different? I mean, I think you and I have both landed on the optimistic side, but are we just caught up in the uh, in the glitz and glamour of uh, of the turnaround? Well, there's a lot of ifs there. If uh, Yella Van Dam actually had a come to God moment and realized that he needs to change his ways if he wants to continue playing, uh, then yes, there's a reason to be optimistic. Um, Yella said he hadn't talked to Kurt. Kurt said he talked to Yella. So uh, who do you believe? Um, but it, it, Kurt made it very clear today. This is a day-to-day thing that, that Yellow Van Damme has not won his spot back, and we'll find out uh, Sunday whether whether he has. Um, so uh, there's reason to be optimistic about that because uh, obviously Kurt has laid down the law and showed that, that no player is too big. Um, so I think that was a step forward. I think if if Kurt is is smart enough, and I'm sure that he is to listen to the players, to go to some of the other players and say, how did this play? What do you think? Did I make the right decision? You know, what would you have liked me to do? And and ask it in, a, in, in just sort of a taking the pulse way, not in a give me advice, because as Kurt said, he's in charge and he, he needs to hammer home that message, I'm in charge. But it doesn't hurt to just say, hey, what do you think of that? Yeah. Um, you know, if he takes the pulse of his players, I, I think he'll realize that he's really on to something here. Uh, and yes, you know, to answer the, uh, the question, yeah, he does have the, the the clout and the ability and whatever you want to call it, the cojones to to bench his captain and and I think he won a lot of plaudits for that. Uh, unfortunately, I'm just looking at the schedule again and and <laughs> man, you know it it just looks so tough. It would have been great if this would have happened, say, in the second half of the Seattle game, and then he had two fairly easy home games coming up and really could have built some momentum. Um, he could depend, punch all the right buttons and, as you said, still come out of that road trip with uh, you know, a couple of points at best. And then people are going to say, well, he didn't get the results. And, in fact, he may have turned this team around. Yeah, it, it's going to be interesting. I think Bruce Arena was always sort of credited with pushing the right buttons at the right time. And so uh, you know, perhaps this is when it needed to happen to have most effect uh, to be able to fix this team. But, KJ, I think you should be a little optimistic, just a little bit. I'm not saying that you know you need to go out and buy a Kurt and Alfo jersey and you know jump up and down. Or what? What does he wear on the sideline, Kevin? Is it usually it's a sweater? Is he? A, yeah. yeah, he's a sweater. So you don't need to buy a Cardinalfo sweater. And actually, if somebody could dress up like Cardinalfo for the next game, I'd really appreciate that. Just send me some pictures over here at Galaxy Podcast on Twitter. Um, I would I would get a kick out of that. All right, let's go to our last call. Yo, go ahead. Let me let me say one more thing about that because as you were talking, I was just thinking, you know, with a veteran player like like Van Damme and your captain, I, I think most of the time what you do if you're going to make a substitution is you do it at halftime. You don't make the player walk off the field in front of everybody. Um, Kurt Anoffel very publicly did that. He made him walk off the field in front of all the fans and take his arm, physically take his armband off and hand it to another player. Um, that, that was a pretty gutsy thing to do. And I think he, it really, and I think that's why the players were very supportive of it because he wasn't trying to avoid, uh, you know, this happening. He wasn't trying to avoid the spectacle. He wasn't trying to have people guess, oh, well, maybe he got hurt and they took him out of halftime. No, he said to everyone, this guy is healthy. He's still playing. He's coming off the field and he's giving the armband to somebody else and he's going to sit and, and he didn't even come out for the second half, which right. by the way, I'm, I'm told Yella apologized to his teammates for that, for not coming back out for the second half. But um, if Kurt wanted to send a message, 
that was the way you do it. Substitute the guy in the first half, make him take the armband on, make him do it publicly at home. And he nailed all of those things. It was a, if he, again, if he's trying to send a message, and I believe he was, he nailed it. Yeah, and, and I want to correct something that I uh, I had hinted at on the Monday show. Uh, Yellow Van Damme was seen at the Champions Lounge at halftime. Um, I think I said he may have been drinking or something like that. I think uh, I think the drinking part may have been like not alcohol, but like coffee or something like that. But regardless of the fact, he was in the Champions Lounge at halftime, and then he didn't show up for the second half out there. So I just wanted to make sure I clarify my stance on that. I had heard rumors of that. Somebody, again, sort of corrected me today uh, in what they saw and so I will take that person's word at it and and that's fine and I you know I, I'll be honest with you I really don't care if Yellow Van Dom was in there drinking a beer or drinking coffee the bottom line was he wasn't out on the bench waiting for his teammates and he wasn't you know in the in the players area he was in the champions lounge which is where the fans are and that's uh, again you know if you want to be on you know team Van Dom which I loved what that guy did last year um, I, I think you need to separate what he did last year with what he has done this year, though. And if he's apologized to his teammates, that goes a big way of, you know, sort of bridging that gap of what happened. And I heard that Yellow Von Dom said that, you know, he takes responsibility for, you know, uh, you know, all, all the things that happened and, you know, that he apologized and it, it, he'll go forward and move forward from there. So like we said, you said uh, a, a come to God, you know, moment. It, it used to be called a come to Bruce m- moment because Bruce is God. Um, as yeah, far as exactly. I was concerned, so uh, so we'll see if if Yella had his little Bruce conversion. Maybe he could, maybe maybe Kurt could send him down the hall and and Bruce could yell at him a little bit or something like that. So uh, let's get to our last call now uh, from Oliver. Oliver from Texas. Hey Josh, this is Oliver from Texas. I just wanted to spill some thoughts on you after watching that game. So first off, I don't want to be like too early to say this, but when can we start talking about? the form of Zardes without having, like, the injury, like, the excuse of saying, oh, well, he just came back on so-and-so. Because I, I he seems seriously out of form. Like, that, that like, alongside with, like, the, like two what it seemed to be, like, really golden opportunities, that bad first touch, and then that corner where he just hit in the side of the net. I don't know. Maybe it's too early to say that. Um, but one other thing, just two more quick hitters. Uh, Romain seems, re- like, to have serious, like, I wouldn't consider them anger issues, but he he weighs like too much of like all the bad things. He like if he makes a mistake or whatnot, has a bad touch, he'll just like freak out and just put that on his head. Like personally, I think that's affecting his form. He like I know like as a player, he's in decent form, like really good form right now, you could say. But that just seems like it just takes him off his game. Um, last thing, also Diallo, he seems really good. I would give him a slight edge over Nathan Smith. Um he he like he had he showed a really good palm with like on the attacking side. I know like you would consider Nathan Smith's better attacker, but he looked really good. Um that's it. Thanks thanks again, Josh, for all the for all the podcast. Take it easy, man. All right, Oliver from Texas calling in. We got I think you know we're big in Texas, Kevin. If we ever wanted to relocate, I think that maybe uh maybe Texas is a place where we could go. Uh maybe AJ would let us stay with him. Was it was it too stu- soon to say that? No, well, you know, we're looking forward to AJ coming here next month, so why not? Why not uh, go there and see him first? Uh, the AJ Bowl when Houston comes back to uh, take on the LA Galaxy in 39 days. Just wanted to reiterate that again. 39 days from re- as we record right now, that is how long it is going to take until the LA Galaxy have another home game. Wow, that's a long time. All right, let's get to uh, let's get to some of Oliver's questions. He's talking about Zardes's form, which is, I think, a legitimate question right now. However, I'll put it in this sort of box before we can say that it definitely is something that, that I'd be worried about. Um, none of the strikers, none of the forwards, nobody has had any success playing in that position as of right now. Uh, the bad first touch is something that people have criticized Jossie's artist for many times. Uh, I think you're seeing him still. Remember, the guy was off, and yes, it is an injury excuse. The guy was off since last August uh, before he came back and played. He is just now getting back into game shape. He's just now starting to do it. I will tell you, after the game, he was pumped up. He was ready to go. Uh, he was one of those guys who I think was definitely upset that... Uh, there wasn't a longer game uh, in this particular game. So, you know, I think you can start asking the question now, Oliver, but also you, you just sort of have to couch it with the offense hasn't been that successful and he is still coming off Andrew. Do you think that's fair, Kevin? Yeah, and, you know, there's a couple other things in, in Oliver's call. I would say with Allison Drini, yes, he does uh, uh, seem to to get upset. He's visible. He, he's very emotional on the field. He goes after referees. 
Who else did that? Robbie Keane. I mean, Alessandrini not only got the number seven, he got the attitude. He's exactly like Robbie Keane. So, um, you know, I tend that's not the way I would go after uh, things. And when I saw, see a player that I think he's getting out of control, but certainly it worked for Robbie Keane. So I'm not going to criticize Alessandrini for it yet. By the way, you know, he has four assists to go with the four goals. He leads the team in both categories after nine games. That's a pretty good pace. Um, yes. I'll take that. Uh, but, uh, you know, more to Jazzy's artists. You know, he has six shots and only two shots on goal. He's played 371 minutes now. He started four games. So that's a shot on. That's just a shot, not a shot on goal. That's a shot every 61 minutes. That's not very good. No. Um, and you're right. The first touch has always been a problem with him. It almost seems as if it, it's it. It kind of looks like, and I know this sounds really funny, but it looks like they're playing takeaway or keep away rather. His teammates are. I mean, he doesn't seem to get in the mix. You know, Allison Drini will pass to Boateng all the time. Boateng will look for Gio. Uh, um, no one seems to be looking for Giassi. He just doesn't seem to be in the mix. And I, I, you know, not for one second do I think that teammates are excluding him, and and nor do I think that Giassi's artist believes he's some kind of decoy and he's running around trying not to get the ball. I think this is something that falls to Kurt Onofo when he makes up his game plan and his strategy is to find a way to get Giassi involved. Yes, the first touch is a problem, so maybe you need to make sure you get him the ball in space where he doesn't turn the ball over with that first touch and allow him to be dangerous. He's also very fast. Find a way to make his speed work. Um, you know, I, I I don't know how to do that. If, if I did, maybe I would be the Galaxy coach. I don't know. You know, maybe do you put him on one wing and Boateng on the other and move Alessandrini inside? He seems to have a lot of success inside, and you don't have Jermaine Jones there, so you need some sort of a playmaker. Uh, you know, maybe that's one way to do it. Do you imagine having Giassi and, and, and Boateng going up the sides? I mean, that would be a track meet. Uh, one other thing Oliver mentioned is Diallo. Um I got a really good look at him at practice today, and Nathan Smith was playing very well in training today, but Diallo is a big boy. Yes. He is uh, very physically imposing and has a lot of physical athletic gifts and is a very smart player. Um, this may be a guy who's going to be there for a long time. He just seems to have everything but experience, and, and Kurt Anoffo seems determined to give him that experience now. And um, you know, By midseason, we could be talking – about a guy who's one of the best players in the well, I admit that might be a little bit early. One of the better players or one of the better right. prospects at that position in the league. Yeah, was well, something I think I said about Nathan Smith as well. Um, listen, I mean, you know, Nathan Smith and anybody on that right hand side has suffered from the fact that Ramon Ram- Ram- Alessandrini has been playing in front of them and they're not getting a lot of defensive help. Uh, Bradley Diallo has led the team in tackles the last two games, uh, mostly because he's being attacked like crazy. Uh, you saw in the second goal that Yellow Van Dom tried to find Bradley Diallo with a long ball on the right-hand side, and David Akam ended up uh, intercepting that and getting on that ball, and they chased it all the way back for a counterattack goal. Um, you know, and that came up that side. The the side was uh, both goals came up uh, uh, on Diallo's side, but overall, I think that whoever's over there is just going to have to understand that they're going to be the place where the opposing teams attack, and they're going to have to be ready for that, and they're going to have to understand that you know shutting them down the best that they can is what they're supposed to do, but that there's a lot of space in front of them with Ramon Alessandrini providing that cover. So I think Bradley Diallo has done great. I really like him. Uh, I think he's earned uh, another look, and if they want to go back to Nathan Smith and, and throw those two guys in and have them, have them battle it out, I'm perfectly okay with that happening and uh you know we'll sort of see how this all shakes out so uh that's it we, hey thanks for the calls remember you can call into the cog hotline anytime you want it's 949-385-2641 that's 949-385-cog1 all right so you can call in anytime you want put it in your speed dial and you can call it halftime yeah you know what i'm gonna encourage you as a matter of fact to call it halftime those are my new favorite ones all right so that's how that works all right kevin let's get to some more listener questions we got from twitter um, but before we do that, I wanted to get to an email, Kevin, on our last podcast that we did, you had talked about, uh, Brian Rowe and Brian Rowe's, uh, parents, right? So, right. So we, we were talking about that. So, uh, this person wrote in, this is from Steve in Burbank and Steve says, uh, just listen to Monday's podcast. Yes. I'm a little behind. This is last Monday's podcast. And since Kevin Baxter mentioned how nice Brian Rowe's parents are, I wanted to share an anecdote. My girlfriend made a row banner at the start of last season. She has liked Ro since the since the Juve game and made the sign to support an unsung hero. Um, let's see. At my let's say at that point it looked like Ro was going to be Kennedy's backup. She has hung up the banner proudly ever every game since. 
before first game of the season, his mother stopped by, Mrs. Rowe stopped by to thank us. She stayed to chat for about five minutes and she couldn't have been nicer. Only bummer is that my girlfriend was in the bathroom at the time, so she missed Mrs. Rowe. <laughs> oh, it's too bad. But she, uh, 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 Steve says, uh, thanks for both. Uh, the Monday and the Thursday shows, they were great. So thanks, Steve, for calling in. But, uh, we, you know, Kevin, you were out of town, so we didn't get to meet up with the Rose. So we're, we're going to have to well, we're gonna have to reschedule. The, 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 the Rose, uh, despite that anecdote, the, the Rose, uh, they're great people. I've spoken to, to both uh, of Brian's parents, and um, they get a, seem to get a little, a little bit uneasy, a little, maybe a little bit embarrassed with the attention. They say, look, it, uh, it's all about Brian. We don't want to talk about ourselves. We don't want to put ourselves out there. So actually, I did hear that uh, by even mentioning them last week, that might not have been the, uh, their high moment of the week. They, they, they just want to be in the background and not get the attention. But yeah, great people. I mean, really supportive. Um, you know, just the kind of parents you want to, you, you, you would want to have Brian's really lucky and I've talked to him about his parents a couple of times and he agrees with me, um, that he's lucky to have, uh, such supportive parents and people who come down from Oregon, you know, quite often to see their son play, uh, for the LA galaxy. And, um, it's no, no secret here that, you know, Diop is a, is a great keeper and will probably be the keeper of the future, but, um, I, I'm a big Brian Rowe fan. Yeah, I know. And, and I think it is, I, I will say that, you know, he's, he's not the only, uh, a player that their parents or even grandparents have, have emailed this show and, and talked to us before. So it's always good to, uh, to hear from everybody. It's fine. We love to hear it. And if you're listening, that means that, uh, we have another set of ears on this and we'll continue to be, uh, as truthful as, as we possibly can with all this stuff and, you know, sort of let it go. If, if there comes a time when uh, Diop, I think Diop is the better player, I will certainly let everybody know. Um, I don't think that time is right now, and Brian Rowe has deserved his time in the light, especially this season. Uh, I think he will be, although I will be honest, in this last game against Chicago, I thought he had several mistakes um, that, were, that were questionable. Um, and so it's something to keep an eye on and whether or not Curtin Alfo sees those mistakes and whether or not you get a surprise start by Diop again, but Diop still hasn't even been in the 18 man roster, uh, in recent days, not against Chicago as well. So, uh, still waiting for him to sort of return from that injury he picked up in the Orlando game. So we'll see that. All right, let's go ahead. Anything else, Kevin? No, I no, think okay. I'm tapped out. Okay. Okay. We got, let's go through rapid fire questions and then we'll, we'll get out of here. Okay. Here let's we go. Let's do it. Here we go. All right. Uh, James uh, James on Twitter. James says, will the Galaxy ever beat 11 men again? So will the Galaxy get a win against a regulation-sized team, Kevin? Yes, and I predict it will come on Sunday, May 21st in Minnesota. In Minnesota. See, I think that's a draw written all over it. So, yes, they will. That's not it. I don't think Houston's it either. So let me let me keep looking down the schedule for a little bit. Uh, let's see. John at Flying Soccer Dad says, did uh, Robbie Rogers officially get out in season-ending injury list? Wasn't yesterday the day it had to be done by and sign someone else. Here's what I know, and Kevin's going to follow up with what he knows. Uh, I was told by the LA Galaxy that it has not be, been done officially yet, but they are expecting something this week uh and then kevin you heard yeah i talked to the galaxy when oh gosh it's been almost a month at least three weeks and they they said that uh they were making the application that mls wanted to see a doctor's report uh robbie underwent a physical that was on a wednesday the galaxy said they expected to hear an answer from the league by friday and then like i said that was three weeks to a month ago nothing has come down officially yet i spoke to someone at the league yesterday and they said their understanding, this person's understanding was that the Galaxy is the one that actually have uh, slowed this procedure down, that they're beginning to have some second thoughts. I don't know what that means. It's pretty clear Robbie is not going to play again this year. Uh, right now, they're just deciding how to allocate the money and how to move it around and how much salary cap space they're going to get. So I, I can't imagine what the holdup is. But the league apparently appears ready to sign off on this, and it's the Galaxy that has slowed down the process. Yeah, I wouldn't worry, John. I wouldn't worry too much about the league deadlines and all that stuff. It seems like all the paperwork was turned in in time. So it's uh, it's one of those. Just just sort of hold on there, and I think eventually— Remember, Dan Kennedy took like three months to figure out that— or to officially know that he was no longer with the team, even though he was in the radio booth since the start of the season. So, I yeah. Uh, you know, Dan Kennedy got a front office job in the radio job. And, and that, you know, I think that's basically the way they say we're going to have to pay you, uh, you know, your salary as a player and you're not playing. So you need to do something. And I was told off the record by someone in the Galaxy front office that 
Robbie will have a similar situation that he will do some sort of work for the club. I mentioned, so is he going to be coming to the StubHub Center? And, and the person laughed and said, no, we have something else for him. I don't know what he'll be, maybe some sort of an ambassador. You know, I know that's very popular in Europe. Maybe he goes around and speaks for the team. Robbie's taken all uh, reference to LA Galaxy off his social media. Um, so uh, I don't know how that sits with the team, but uh, there appears to be maybe that's what they're still working out. What will Robbie's role be? What will his employment uh, situation be with the Galaxy? What will he be asked to do? Uh, and if he balks at that, then, then does the team still have to pay him? And so maybe that's where it's got hung up. But I'm told Robbie will have some, some uh, you know, um, ties with the team going forward. But he hasn't been seen around Stub Up Center and. It's probably going on six weeks to two months now. Yeah, it's been a while, that's for sure. All right, there's the answer. Uh, you already answered at, uh, LA Galaxy Outsiders question. Uh, he said uh, El, uh, Le Garçon, which is his uh, his nickname for Roman Alessandrini, was not at training today. Uh, should we be concerned? We already talked about that, that uh, according to the LA Galaxy, uh, he was working out and uh, and getting some, some additional uh, recovery time, I guess, uh, downstairs and didn't come upstairs for training. Kevin told you to, he... He's a little leery of that. So that's the uh, that's the answer to that. Let's go to uh, Dan. And Dan says, um, are we trying to win over former Chivas USA fans by turning the club into a dysfunctional S show? I, I cleaned that up for the family show that we have. <laughs> um, I think there could be an argument for that, Dan. I'm not going to say no right now. But um, I, I think that in their mind, the LA Galaxy think they're trying to put together a, a revolutionary plan that's going to take the league by storm. Um, I just don't think that that's happened, or not even close to that. So, uh, so we'll we'll leave that one with that one. Let's go to uh, to this next one from Jose, and Jose says, uh, and he's talking specifically to you, Kevin. This is a you question written all over it. With jo- uh-huh. with Jones being a short term signing, do you see them going after Gio's brother, Jonathan Dos Santos, to pair with Joao Pedro? The Jones experiment has failed. Well, yeah, I mean, Jermaine's not going to be back for next season. Uh, we're pretty sure of that. Um, I get the feeling, I know that Gio still talks it up, but I get the feeling that front office has moved on from Jonathan Dos Santos, that that ship has kind of sailed. Um, I don't know how serious they really were because they went out and they looked at at four midfielders uh, this winter that we know of. Probably they looked at more. I was told Jao Pedro and Alessandrini were the guys that they wanted. Um, So if they really only had room for two, especially with salary cap space, and then Jonathan Dos Santos wasn't one of those two, does that mean that he was a little bit of a decoy and a diversion? Did that mean they were really serious about him? I, I don't see him as being the answer. I think it would make Geo happy. Um, there are, you know, we talked about on the show before, there are some political problems with that. How much uh, power then would that give uh, Dodo Santos' father, who is their agent uh, over, you know, uh, club movements and starting lineups and those kind of things? I don't see that happening. I, I think that the Galaxy are looking for some big names. It sounds like they're looking for strikers. We keep hearing names like Carlos Vela come up um, as people they're interested in. I, you know, I wouldn't discount the, the the Jonathan Dos Santos thing. You know, he may be the guy that falls in their lap if everything else falls through. And certainly uh, in midfield is a place where they could st- apparently still use a little bit of help. I, I That would not be my first go-to signing, though. I don't think that's the one that's at the top of their list either. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, the whole thing sort of comes at, they said that they were going to go after positions and need Kevin. That was sort of their their big thing this year. They said, we're going to go after positions that we need and not just big names and, and all that stuff. You know, the more it keeps happening, the more I think that a, a central midfielder might be something they need with Sebastian Legette's long-term injury, with Jermaine Jones having an, an injury of sort of unknown uh, certainty here. Uh, they're, they're starting to get a little thin. You got Baggio Husidic, you got Joao Pedro in there, you know, is there a way to find sort of that central attacking midfielder, that that creative player that can they can sit there and link with Giovanni Dos Santos? I'm I'm with you, Kevin, in terms of I have severe reservations about uh, getting another Dos Santos on the team and and sort of how that family uh, in, interacts with the club and and to see what the issues are and whether or not Kurt Anolfo can be a manager strong enough to counteract that because I think we've seen in in the past that some Galaxy managers have not been strong enough to counteract that. So I think it's a really uh, interesting thing. I'm going to say that it's not completely out of the realm of possibility, but Kevin, you know, up until Jermaine Jones's injury, I would say that the LA Galaxy weren't interested in that anymore. If this is going to be a longer-term injury, perhaps they go back and take another look at it. Although, again, not 100% sure on that well, one. Here's a real wild card. If, if they're going for a position of need, let's let's just say for sake of argument that Yellow Van Damme is uh, now a part-time player. We don't know that. You know, we're just... Uh, you know, Kurt Anoffel said day to day. All of a sudden, you have a back line with 
Daniel Sturridge, who has one full season in, uh, Dave Romney, who hasn't been a starter, you know, an everyday uh, full season starter at all in his career. Then you have Diallo, uh, you know, backed up by Nathan Smith. Ashley Cole is the only guy with any experience in the back line. Uh, I know MLS clubs tr- traditionally do not go out and sign big name players as defenders, but if you're serious about the position of need, it seems like the back line may be one that's becoming very needy right now. Yeah, and and that is an argument that I think holds a lot of water is that even without Yella, even with Yella Von Dom back there, do you find somebody to sort of fill in for Daniel Starez? Because knowing Daniel Starez has had some issues at that position and also knowing that you have a weaker you know player or a player with less experience on that right-hand side, do you go and you backstop some of that defense? So also uh, a, a very reasonable argument to sort of look to see where the LA Galaxy in positions in need where they might look. Um, Jose follows up again and asks, and I'm pretty sure this is this is a question for me. He says, also, uh, do you love chicken nuggets? And <laughs> uh, and to answer your question, Jose, yes, I do love chicken nuggets with a with a passion, uh, quite honestly. So I, Kevin, how are you on chicken nuggets up or down? I'm a vegetarian, so I have to say no. So yes, you love Although chicken nuggets. Although I don't nuggets. know how much meat there is in those chicken nuggets, That's right? If you're the, like McDonald's. Yeah, there, you don't even have to worry about that. Yeah, yeah. So you're missing out on the chicken nugget thing. I think that there should be a special pass for vegetarians that you should be able to eat chicken nuggets just because they're, they're God's food as far as I'm concerned. All right, uh, let's go on. Uh, let's see. Uh, Cameron writes in, and at Camelman33, he says, uh, does Gio now get into the central attacking midfielder because JJ is injured? Although we never really know where he plays anyway in, in terms of where uh, Jermaine Jones plays. Uh, so do you see Dos Santo taking over that 10 role like he did in the second half, Kevin? Yes, because I think he feels like he has a lot more freedom now. I do feel like he felt like people were breathing down his neck. And I, I, I feel like he really felt constrained. And you know what? You can make you can make the argument. I know you talk a lot about many of his goals last year being inconsequential, uh, you know, in games that had already been decided. But I think you do have to also look at the stats, which show that he was clearly better, uh, at least numbers wise, was clearly better when Robbie Keane was not on the field. Yep. And I felt, think a little bit of that was he didn't feel like he was free to do what he wanted for whatever reason, whether Robbie sucked the air out of the out of the balloon or whether. Um, you know, whether Robbie was getting in his way or whatever it was, he just wasn't successful. And I, and I sort of felt that this year, too, that there were long stretches when, you know, people talked about Gio and, and me, too, talked about Gio apparently taking, uh, you know, just disappearing. I think a lot of that was he didn't know where to go. He didn't know where he fit in because there were no there was no space for him. Now a ton of space has opened up with Jermaine Jones being gone for at least three to four weeks. Uh, I, I do expect you're going to see a much more dangerous uh, Giovanni Dos Santos and one that feels like he can operate and do what he wants and people will play off of him. I don't think he felt that way before. Yeah, I, I think that uh, that uh, you're going to find Giovanni Dos Santos definitely in that role. I think he's relishing that role even after the game again. Well, I talk about these guys, and after the game, Gio was pumped up. He was ready to go. If they could have played another 45 minutes, the LA Galaxy would have won that game. No question about it. That team was pumped up. They would have easily played another 45 and just blown Chicago away. Um, just by the way and the energy that was in the room. Kevin, you know, and you're the perfect person to say this because uh, Brittany was on the show on Monday, and, and she agreed with me, but you and I have been in this locker room. Another, another breaking news phone call, Kevin Baxter. Another another breaking news phone call. Is that is that no, how, what? Yeah, that's Jermaine Jones that's, on the line. I'm sure. let, let me take that. <laughs> yeah, no problems. But no, I was going to say you're the perfect person. We have been in this, um, in these locker rooms now for a while together. And when there is a loss or there is a bad game, there's a we have to walk in in a certain way. If it was a loss, right? We can't go in there boisterous and being loud and stuff like that. You have to sort of match the vibe of the room. And the vibe of the room on Saturday night was. We're energized. We're ready. We figured something out. You, we can, we can, pl- we're, we can be loud in this room. We can have some fun. Like we're going to tell you how it is, and you know now we're we don't have to hide behind. Hey, we lost the game, or hey, we didn't play very well. We get to tell you because we think we played really well, and we want to talk about it. And and that sort of seems like how it was on Saturday night. Yeah, I mean, you see a lot of those quotes. People talking about uh, looking forward in the past. They all talked about looking back. It was like we need to fix this and we need to do that, and and this this didn't work. Now that they, they they did seem very fired up after that game, and I'll tell you, at training today there were a lot more smiles. Um, and I'm not sure whether you know there are two different kinds of smiles. Well, there's many different kinds, but two kinds I think of when I see uh, athletes. One is a smile of relief, like we figured it out or we got past that test or whatever it is, and then there's the smile of 
you know, happiness and anticipation going forward. As you said, we figured something out. We can hardly wait to play again. I think I saw both those smiles out there today. Everybody seemed to be enjoying being out on the field and being with one another. And it's just like a big weight has been lifted off. And again, we'll go back to the same thing. And I know we sound like a broken record. Man, this could not have come at a, at a worse time because they've got this mojo going for them and they got four really tough road games coming up. And uh, again, man, it would have been great if this happened in the second half against Seattle. If you're a Galaxy fan, that's what you would have wanted to see because they could have won then, you know, uh, the tie and then won the next two games easily. But instead, they have this big high and they go off onto the road where they could play their best game of the year against the New York Red Bulls and still lose. Yeah, and that's that's sort of going to be the thing. All right, two last questions, and then we are out of here. Uh, and and they're sort of both along the same line. So Allison, um, at Allison. By the way, Allison has at Allison on Twitter. Did, Allison, were you like the first Allison on Twitter? Because, or are there ones in there that I don't, or, or lowercase? No, I, I think that she actually has Allison. Anyway, I'm getting sidetracked. It's a Twitter you know, sort of holy grail. You have your actual name. Um, so at Allison says, is there a power struggle between Kurt Anolfo and Van Dam? Does Anolfo's I'm the leader hurt the team and Van Dam's future performances? And Josh comes in and at Josh Al- Aldrete, I want to say that right. I, I probably screwed it up. But anyway, at Josh says, uh, uh, given Kurt's tactical decision to bench Yella, do you see there being a h- higher amount of tension in the locker room? So I'll, I'll, let me let me touch on Josh's real quick. I see there being less tension in the locker room right now, quite honestly. I think weight has been lifted off the shoulders, but I think there's also this realistic expectation that the players that are going to be on the field from now on are going to be performing or they're going to be sitting on the bench. And so if you want to call that sort of a nervous energy in the room or or a motivational energy, I think, Josh, perhaps you could go uh, that way, Kevin. But is there a power struggle between Anolfo and Van Dam, or, or do you think we've settled this? I think we've settled it. And if 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 Yella thinks there's a power struggle and thinks he can win this. He is sorely mistaken. Uh, I, I think the re, the team's reaction to what happened uh, on Saturday uh, tell, tells you that. I mean, the team easily could have sided with Yella. Um, you know, they didn't seem to to be upset with with Ema, or they didn't seem to be upset with Ashley Cole when they sort of disrespected, um, you know, Kurt Onofa when they came off the field as, uh, when they were substituted off. At least we didn't hear anything about it. We heard nothing but positive responses to this. And I think the ball is back in Yellow's court now. I think it's up to him to uh, – he's already apologized to the team apparently. Uh, it's a little bit unclear whether he and Kurt has, have had a meeting. Kurt said they've talked. Yellow said they didn't. Um, but it's up to Yellow now. I mean if he goes in with hat in hand and I'm really sorry, I want to be part of this team. I want, I want to earn – I don't think he gets the armband this weekend by the way. If he, if he starts, I would be surprised. I don't know who you give it to, I guess, Gio. Um, but, you know, if Kurt goes and says, or if Yella comes and says, I, I want to earn my position back, I want to earn back the armband, give me a chance, please. I think Kurt says, yeah, you're our guy, go back out there. And then he has a chance to earn the armband back. But if he's, if he's going to act like Kurt and Awful disrespected him and that, uh, you know, he was right all along, it's a losing battle. And, and I don't see any of the players coming to his side. I think, you know, even though they feuded, they're both veterans. I think the one guy that might have sided with him if a power struggle had developed would have been Jermaine. But with Jermaine being injured, I don't know that his opinion is going to carry a lot of weight since he's not going to be on the field. So, you know, if Yellow wants to fight this, it's going to be a a one-man fight. I think he'd be much wiser and smarter uh, to just accept the penalty apologize and move on you know he was the most popular player and or one of the most popular player and certainly the most uh um, useful player last year he has a lot of goodwill built up i mean don't blow it all right now it's not worth it yeah i I think this is the the big issue from this podcast kevin is that we are seeing we we are we are blowing some people's minds because they were firmly rooted in the yellow von dom camp and ever since the Saturday night, I expected to go in there and see players that were upset. I expected to see players that were like, hey, you know, Kurt's lost it. Um, you know, we're not going to pay any, pay any attention. But their response and their actions and, and the things that they said after the locker room gave me the exact 100% opposite feeling. And if there's one thing that I can do in my position, having done this many podcasts and having been in, uh, you know, post-game locker rooms with this team many, many, many times over the years, is that I try to impress upon you the feeling that I get when I'm in the room because it's not something that you can read in quotes and it's not even sometimes something you can hear uh, in the quotes even whenever we uh, we play those quotes although though hearing it certainly gives you a better idea of of what it was and some of this can be false it can be false confidence in this team that maybe they figured something out but if things start to go the wrong way they'll collapse again and they'll turn against Kurt 
But as of right now, as we sit, this LA Galaxy team is better off than they were after the Philadelphia game. It's better off than they were after the Seattle game. It is it is in a good healthy position a locker room that was on in, on the very brink of collapsing and opening up and and destroying itself from within may have solidified itself for a while but if they go up on this road trip if they have some some difficult times if things don't go their way you know I'm not saying it can't fall back and everything falls apart again um, but right now, from what we're seeing and what we're hearing from the players and, and sort of what the reaction was in the second half against Chicago is this Galaxy team might have some fight in it. And if it has some fight in it, then this season's not over yet. And so maybe it's it, it's worth it to, to sort of stick it out. Um, but again, if you're a Fire Kurt guy, uh, Kevin, if there's people out there who are Fire Kurt pe- guys, they're going to be upset um, because Kurt has bought himself some time to mess with this roster a little bit more. Well, and, you know, the the players talk about this, too. The Seattle Sounders last year with their run, it's changed a lot of people's opinion about how to win an MLS. You know, everyone talks about every game counts and all those kind of things. And, yeah, it does. But 20 points after 20 games and they wind up winning the MLS Cup. Galaxy are kind of on pace for that. They're, uh, they're what, eight, eight points uh, after nine games, right? Yep, yep, you're right. So they're one point off that pace. Um you know, no one wants to, fight, you know, as, as players said, too, that doesn't mean we're going to do that. That doesn't mean we want to do that, but it does mean it's possible. So as bad as the Galaxy have looked, you know, I, it's it's 45 minutes in a nine game season so far. But that second half against Chicago has to have you thinking, you know, if they can put this together over longer stretches, you know, maybe there's a chance. As I said, the second half of the season, they're home a lot. The schedule, the schedule gets a lot easier in the second half of the season. Um, and that would be the perfect time for the Galaxy to go on a little bit of a run. Hey, it's it's all possible. Everything's possible. I would caution you against thinking that they could do what Seattle did. I think that was a little special. Plus, there's two more teams, and they didn't add two more playoff spots. So I would expect that uh, it's going to be a little more difficult uh, than even Seattle had. But at the same time, nothing is impossible. It's Major League Soccer, uh, and we're going to get to see that. So the LA Galaxy will face off against the New York Red Bulls on Sunday, May 14th. Uh, this is at tw- this is at 3 p.m. Pacific time. It is a nationally televised game, Fox Sports One. Um, that's where you want to watch it, FS1. Uh, and you know it's going to be interesting to see the LA Galaxy. Like I said, I'm pretty sure the stat is correct. I keep having it in my mind, so it must be correct. The LA Galaxy have not won on the East Coast since 2012 when they beat the Philadelphia Union. All right, and we'll double check that. And if you find it differently, you know, tweet it at me, and I'll, I'll make a correction next podcast. But I believe that's correct. The LA Galaxy now will go on the road to New York, the road to San Jose, the road to Minnesota, the road to uh, DC United, not necessarily in that order, so don't yell at me and scream at me whenever it comes back differently, all right? So, uh, Kevin, anything else? We good? We're good. All right, let's go ahead and get out of here. If you're looking for Mr. Kevin Baxter on Twitter, it's at kbaxter11. And, of course, latimes.com, where Kevin is the uh, soccer writer over there and also doing a lot of hockey coverage as well. But soccer still, go check him out, latimes.com. If you're looking for me on Twitter, at J Guessman, J-G-U-E-S-M-A-N. And, of course, at Galaxy Podcast. All right, go to cornerofthegalaxy.com where you can read all of our articles. Uh, we'll have some more stuff up there. There's Jermaine Jones injury news. There's podcasts. There's everything else in between. So please head on over there. All right, for Mr. Kevin Baxter, for Miss Madison Cole, I'm Josh Guessman, and you've been listening to Corner of the Galaxy from the Box on cornerofthegalaxy.com. Have a great night, everybody. You've been listening to the Corner of the Galaxy from the Box podcast on cornerofthegalaxy.com. You can follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at Galaxy Podcast. And be sure to check out and subscribe to iTunes, Stitcher, and Facebook by searching for Corner of the Galaxy. And for all of your independent LA Galaxy news, discussion, and entertainment, including this podcast, head on over to cornerofthegalaxy.com. Fans, thanks for listening. We ask that you be kind and courteous to your neighbors as you leave the podcast. We thank you for joining us and look forward to seeing you again. Until then, I'm Michael Araujo, and on behalf of the entire Corner of the Galaxy crew, goodbye, everybody.